everyone. Again, thank you, Secretary, for coming out, and thanks for bringing such a large posse of mascot people. We are very appreciative. Um, we are going to start by giving you a bit of a summary of what Franklin County is and what our infrastructure challenges are. I'm sorry, sorry, Mayor, I'm talking to your back. Um, so our goal for this presentation is to introduce you to Franklin County and the challenges faced by rural communities. Our belief that we hope you will walk away believing too is that rural Massachusetts has experienced decades of funding inequity and that we are challenged now with an infrastructure that's in disrepair and that the problems have reached a crisis point. After every section, we offer recommendations. Some might call them bold recommendations. We call them good recommendations. So let me tell you about Franklin County first. Franklin County is the most rural county in Massachusetts. We have 71,000 people across 725 square miles. If you take out the huge metropolis of Greenfield with 18,000 people, the average population of our towns is 2,000 or less, approximately. Um, population has been stagnant in Franklin County for the past two decades, and there are projections, population projections through 2040 that project a precipitous decline in population in Franklin County. We will say that the model used was pretty urban-centric and didn't include things that have really changed Franklin County like broadband in every community. That said, we are taking the projections very seriously and doing everything we can to prevent that from happening because that kind of population decline would be terrible not just for Franklin County, but we would argue for all of Massachusetts. Only five of our 26 communities have professional planning staff, and really our, our towns have very little capacity in staffing. That means it's hard for our towns to apply for discretionary grants and then puts us even further back. 75% of the county's revenue is reliant on residential property tax. Five of our communities are in the top 10 of municipal residential tax rates. Six of our communities are in the top 10 of being close to their levy limit. These two conditions make it very hard for our towns to increase revenue for transportation infrastructure maintenance. Add to this that many of our towns have a huge amount of acreage in state-owned permanently protected land. Using Warwick for an example, one of the top five residential property tax rates, one of the towns close to the levy limit, 40% of their land, state-owned land. For those that don't know, the pilot formula is based on property value growth. Property values are growing faster in eastern Massachusetts. So even if pilot stays the same, Warwick sees a declining amount of pilot revenue every year. So Warwick, like many Franklin County towns, are struggling. Um, more Franklin County quick facts. Great picture of Representative yeah. Blaze. <laughs> <laughs> Showing that this Davis County Road is closed due to mud. But uh, we have 1,630 miles of paved roads, 420 miles of unpaved roads, so that means a typical town is 2,000 people, 62 miles of roads, 41 bridges, and five, 630 culverts. Um, our, trans, our TIP target is about 7.5 million. We receive 2.54% of target funds because the formula is basically predominantly based on population. But an average TIP project for our region is $10 million. So that means that we are funding our TIP projects over two, sometimes three years. We'll talk a bit about Chapter 90 next, but our towns are somewhat hesitant to go through to spend their Chapter 90 on design and engineering for the TIP because the process, as everyone in this room knows, is hard and cumbersome 
and especially difficult for towns with limited capacity. That said, a quick shout out to D1 for helping us get Buckland North Street through the TIP process in an expedited fashion, and a shout out to D2 who's working with us in Mascot Right-of-Way, meeting every two weeks with the Town of Orange to make sure they get their right-of-way done for a big project on the TIP this year. So, on average, our towns get $229,000 of Chapter 90. This is one of the primary reasons why our towns are unwilling and a little nervous about using Chapter 90 for design and engineering of TIP, because the cost to repave, not reconstruct, repave, one mile of road is about $340,000. So you can see the challenges that they have because of the Chapter 90 formula that, again, is primarily based on population. So we're going to talk a bit about unpaved roads, and then we're going to talk about transit and rail. We're not going to talk much about complete streets, pedestrian facilities, bike facilities, because we have a great partnership with MassDOT, and there's funding that really has helped our region move forward on those areas. We're gonna concentrate on where we need help. And so starting with unpaved roads, 26% um, of our roads in Franklin County are unpaved. We don't get enough Chapter 90 funding to pave those roads, but also they help maintain the rural character of our, of our region, so money towns don't want to pave them. That said, with climate change and continuing freeze and thaw cycles, multiple mud seasons, microburst storms, our dirt and gravel roads are in trouble. There is no real funding for full depth reconstruction of dirt and gravel roads. Our towns don't get enough Chapter 90. Those roads are not eligible for the T for TIP funding. And so we have dirt and gravel roads that are literally 100 years old and have never been fully reconstructed. That fits, is a challenge for us. So what have we been doing at the COP? We've been trying to help our towns make good decisions. We've done culvert assessments that assess the size and the condition of every culvert in town. The report is, includes map and report and helps our towns prioritize how they are going to use Chapter 90 for the maintenance of their roads. We are working to develop guidance for towns about best practices for drainage culverts using hydrological analysis so that hopefully our towns are right-sizing culverts and able to prevent the damage experienced <coughs> by major storm events. And we're creating a best management practice on how to care for dirt and gravel roads that hopefully will help our towns use their money efficiently and wisely. For those of you I think the districts know, not all of you may know, is that we also have a collective purchasing program and we do collective purchasing for 59 towns across western and central Massachusetts. The more the merrier because you get better pricing and we, do, we, will, we procure 22 highway products and services and that includes cold patch, asphalt, salt, sand, fuel, uh, line painting, catch basin cleaning, basically trying to help our towns with transportation infrastructure maintenance. So here's where we begin with our bold recommendations, but I think you're gonna be nodding yes as we go through them all. So the TIP and the Chapter 90 formulas disadvantage rural mass because population is the primary factor used in the formulas. So what we would love to see is anytime Chapter 90 is um, over annually 200 million, that any extra amount of funding is distributed by road miles only not the current formula of road miles, population, and jobs in a town. We are thrilled that Governor Healy put $24 million of rural, rural road funds into the budget. We would hope that that is a continuing uh, line item in the state budget. We would also ask that MassDOT support and act relative to unpaved roads. Even without that legislation, much of this work can get started assessing dirt and gravel roads, really looking at best management practices, 
identifying the impacts of climate resiliency. And then, would be fantastic if you created an unpaid road fund um, using fair share funds, especially for that issue of reconstructing dirt and gravel roads. Moving to transit, we are served by the Franklin Regional Transit Authority. It is the largest RTA in Massachusetts, serving 42 towns, 1,100 plus square miles, very different than the other two rural RTAs in Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, as you can see from this map. That said, the, R the FRTA is the little engine that could, that could and does a lot because they understand Franklin County and understand what we need to do to make transit expanded in Franklin County. One thing that was just done, thank you so much, is the new maintenance facility. The um, FRTA buses were sitting in a hundred year old, not very nice place, <laughs> that would have cost more to rehabilitate than just to build new. And so this we this is the ribbon cutting from last September. This is the ribbon cutting that we had recently. <laughs> Um, the Franklin Regional Transit Authority was the only RTA in Massachusetts that did not have any fixed roof weekend service. They received fair share funding in the fall and worked quickly to get drivers and vehicles and able to start weekend service on January 21st. And now this is in a pilot phase, but really a remarkable improvement in service to the residents and visitors of Franklin County. So this is in the pilot phase and then we will work together with FRTA to come up with a permanent schedule, but the fair share funds have been really helpful. FRTA went fair free during COVID um, using CARES Act funding, and this slide will tell you why. It costs the FRTA about $181,000 a year to collect fares because so many of our transit users um, have no other option, they get half fares. So the fare revenues being brought into the region is 120,000. The math doesn't really work, and so we would hope that MassDOT would be supportive of FRTA and other RTAs in this situation going permanently fare free. What we've long realized is that big buses going down major highways are not serving our rural region particularly well. FRTA was one of the first transit authorities in Massachusetts to look at microtransit starting in 2017. With two earmarks and some fair share funding, the access program has started. Next slide. <laughs> So here's how it works. The access program uses scheduling software to fill empty seats on demand response vehicles. Um, clients can book rides up to a week in advance or in real time. It's currently operating in four zones in Franklin County and really helps to get people to doctor's appointments, to grocery stores, to other important th areas and appointments that they need to go to. And with fair share funding, we would love to see this expanded. We really see that microtransit is the future of transit, especially in rural areas, and that this is a really successful model of how it can work. So, transit in rural areas requires innovation, creativity, patience, and dependable funding. And so our recommendations here is to increase RTA funding levels, especially for the 5311 RTAs, and to support the continuation and expansion of microtransit using fair share funding. Really what we're asking for is permanent and predictable and increased funding for our RTAs so that we can better serve the residents of Franklin County. Moving to passenger rail, this is Maureen Mullaney our longtime transportation program manager, who passed away a few years ago. So, whew, okay, made it through that. <laughs> um, Franklin County lost all passenger rail service in 1985. With the rerouting of um, the Vermonter on the Connecticut River Line, 
We started getting passenger service again in 2014. The Valley Flyer was started in 2019 with very aggressive ridership thresholds. It was started as a pilot program. We met those ridership thresholds and the, and the service became permanent in October of 2023, which is really exciting. And here's why. You, this is ridership at the Greenfield Station and C, except for that little blip that was called COVID in 2020 and 2021, you see that ridership just is continuing to expand. Um, with thanks to MassDOT for funding, we've also done the uh, marketing campaign for the Valley Flyer, and our consultants say that it's doing really well, and so I'm going to read to you what they have to say because I really am not a marketing person. Um, but our two-week reboot of this campaign in February garnered an impressive 440,000 plus impressions and a 2.37% click-through rate, which beats our benchmark of 2.06%. Isn't that great? <laughs> we're told that's really great. I don't know what that means, but we're told it's really great. Um, and this goes back to why we are so focused on last mile transit as well. We want people to get off the train and be able to move and go throughout Franklin County and experience our outdoor recreation, et cetera. And so we're so committed to last mile transportation options. So we are serving our residents, but also our visitors and dealing, uh, addressing our economic development potential. We're su super supportive of the Compass efforts to expand east-west rail between Boston, Springfield, and Pittsfield, or west-east rail, however you'd like to say it. Um, but we also really want the northern tier. We really think the northern tier would be transformational for Franklin County and would and we'd really ask that um, we can continue to think about how to get that service. So our recommendations here are, I swear I read that Governor Healy has called for a statewide growth management <coughs> plan, but now I can't find where I read it. Anyone know? Well, we think there should be a statewide growth management plan. <laughs> um, because the population projections that look at a 40% increase in population in Boston, but a 25% decrease in population for Franklin County, doesn't make sense for the Commonwealth as a whole. And that really thinking about how we can better explore where growth goes and trying to encourage people to go out to Frank, come out to Franklin County to live is critical for our region, it's critical for, critical for the Commonwealth, and expansion of passenger rail is one way to make that a reality. So we would support that if I made up the growth management plan someone maybe should recommend it to Governor Healy because it's a great idea. <laughs> but also we'd really like to see how we can expand um, the effort and resources dedicated to Northern Tier. And so I'm gonna pause now because I think we have time for discussion and questions and answers and we have some people who are gonna say something. You wanna start, Tina? Um, sure, great presentation. Um, Again, I think the challenges that we are all facing here in these rural areas um, range anywhere from transportation to a whole host of things, but it's fantastic to have everybody in the same room to kind of um, get a bigger picture, I guess, of what it is. We, we have these daily challenges, whereas you know, we have meetings like this and everybody can see the totality of what we're talking about, but it is a daily um, occurrence for us that we're, we're dealing with, and based on our staff, it's Michael and myself that are trying to put these ideas together and find creative ways to implement them along with the help of Megan and Beth and Linda and the staff of the Council of Governments. Um, so again, we appreciate you being here. We um, certainly are appreciative of your leadership and obviously with the assistance of Tom Schiavone and Mer Meredith um, Schlesinger, you know, some of these projects wouldn't be possible and the patience that you have for some of these ideas and the projects that we, we go to are, um, again, very much appreciated. We did start weekend service. Um, we're very excited about that. We're hoping with the fair share funds that we can expand upon that and also increase our evening hours. Right now, what we're facing is a workforce shortage. We are unfortunately, like all of the other RTAs in the state, having to find um, qualified CDL drivers to operate our vehicles has become 
a huge challenge for us. Um, so it is great that we have things like the access program because we're able to use non-CDL operators for this service. Um, and if we were to expand that service tomorrow and have enough vehicles to do that, we would again um, be able to fill those buses because right now we're at capacity. We're turning you know, trips down um, on a daily basis for that. So um, again, Natalie, Joe, and Aaron, and Paul, and Suzanne, and everybody's here, you know, we really appreciate the efforts and the understanding that you have for our challenges here in this rural area because again, based on the roads and the formulas that um, the tip and everything has, we, again, as an RTA, there are certain formulas that are put together that depend on how we get our state funding. And that is something that we looked to hopefully change at some point as well. I think last year in FY23, we just did an analysis. We traveled over 983,000 miles with our transit vehicles um, in FY23. And our ridership is increasing. We're getting up to levels that are higher than they were um, pre-COVID or about that, that area. So um, we're very excited about that. And we just see a lot of potential with this extra fair share funding. So again, thank you very much. Thanks, Tina. Uh, one of our staff, Ryan, has a friend who has a CDL license and he's looking for a job. We want and Ryan to drive. Ryan's here. <laughs> go work in the town. Go work in the town. No, no, go work for the FRTA. Wait, no, do both. Do both. So, um, Mayor, do you want to say a few words about Greenfield? I'm delighted to have that weekend service beginning. That was a big boom for the, for the, for the city. And, uh, and now uh, looking for that, that east west would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. That it? Mm -hmm. She did not take her two minutes, so we will move <laughs> to <laughs> Jesse Dean, Franklin County Chamber of Commerce. I just want to thank everyone for being here. I think, as we know, infrastructure and the challenges we face across the county, sure, across the county are so uniquely tied to some of the workforce development challenges we're having. Um, and as Linda said, the population projections are something we are taking very seriously. We're very concerned about. Um, 2040 doesn't seem that far off for our folks here. Um, and so in order to really make this region um, as enticing as possible, we need these infrastructure challenges met now. Um, this is one of the most beautiful special places in the world. I'm excited to get in the cars and have you all see that for yourselves. People love it here. We're also the Regional Tourism Council, so we get that feedback on a daily basis. When people really discover Franklin County, they want to come back, and we want them to, but we want them to have on-demand transportation. We want them to be able to discover all that the county has to offer as easily as possible. So we just really appreciate all the efforts and your participation today. Thank you. I think we're now to Margie. Margie is from the town of Leverett, who is experiencing the joy and woes of dirt and gravel road maintenance. That's true. Um, I'm wondering if, we, do I have a video? You, you know what we didn't end up doing, it was a little too motion sickness-y. <laughs> I was really relying on that. Um, so, Leverett has the interesting um, honor of owning the town of Road of Douglasville. And um, it's become somewhat locally famous because a few years ago, it's about a mile and a half long, mile point three long. And a few years ago, during a particularly good fun season, it was closed for several days. And was people were parking at one end of it and walking home for the evening, and coming in the next morning and walking out so that they could drive home and get to work. So. That was a few years ago. We have actually done a lot of work and a lot of maintenance to it, and it has not had to be closed since then. Um, but we did have a great video of somebody driving it during that time, where you really do feel like, when you're when you're watching it, you feel like you're gonna go off the road, or you feel like you're sick, or you feel like, and um, and to me, I think it's a really unique sensation of gravel roads, of what it feels like. I was driving just the other day on my own road. And with my 18-year-old daughter, who's had her license for about a year, and we pulled into the road, and it was nice and muddy, so it sucked your tires in, and it sort of pulled you where you want to go, or where it wants you to go. And she's like, what's going on? And I said, this is mud season, honey. This is what happens. It grabs your tires, and you have to figure out how to keep your car in the road and in the ruts without bottoming out or without you know, having some piece of your car fall off. Um, so it's a unique sensation. And 
I just in the last couple of days of work, I happened to run into two of my highway superintendents that have probably about 35 years worth of experience maintaining our gravel roads. And, um, and they were very interesting to talk to when asked this question, like what's unique about gravel roads? And I think one thing that came out was it has changed in the last few years. As Linda mentioned, climate change has made it harder. Uh, they used to freeze and they'd be solid, so you actually had a surface to plow. Now they don't. They freeze and they melt and they freeze and they melt and it pours on them all winter long. So it makes for a very different surface and it makes for a mud season that can go on for a couple of months versus a week or so. Um, on the other side is what one of my highway supers said was it's a, it's a labor intensive maintenance, not necessarily a materials intensive maintenance because you have a grader and as long as you have someone who knows how to use the grader, because it's a unique skill, it's not a specific CDL, it's how do you use a grader and how do you do it so that you can grade your gravel roads from two to six times a year and basically you take a, what's been a beat up, chewed up road and you turn it into a brand new road. And that's kind of cool. Um, it's, other than it's a day or two of someone's work, it's not very expensive to do because there's not a lot of materials there. Um, however, it's a day or two of someone's fairly skilled and unique work. Um, the other thing that they mentioned was that they used to dread rainy weekends because they know there's more traffic over the weekend and they're going to go into work and realize that all of their gravel roads are chewed up because it rained on them and beat them up and it's going to be full of potholes and that's what they're going to do on Monday and Tuesday is recover all those gravel roads. Um, and of course there's a lot of dust. So, but I don't want to make it, as Linda also mentioned, I don't want to make it that they're only negative because they're really great roads. And one of the comments one of my highway super had is, I said, well, what's the benefit? Why do we have them? Why do we keep them? And he said, because I feel like I'm driving through history. And that I'm driving the same road that my ancestors drove, and it looks the same, and it's beautiful. So we do like them, and we love them, and they have a new challenge. So that's my story about Grandma Rhodes. <laughs> Thanks, Margie. I think Jesse forgot one thing. Oh, sorry, go ahead, McNally. Would you mind just talking with everybody about the tie and bond study and what the cost is to reconstruct that roadway? Of course. Um, so yes, back to really Dudleyville. Um, Dudleyville is a road um, that, as we said, as I pointed out, was closed for a while. And then, and I also was thinking, you know, so Leverett's a town of 1,800 people. Um, we, I don't believe, have any fixed route going through our town for transit. Um, which actually poses unique, there, I could talk about public transit for a while, but um, <laughs> so we had a couple of residents come to us and say, Dudleyville Road needs something to happen for it. And so they, three years ago, helped me, they actually did all of the narrative to do a one-stop application to get some funding to try to rebuild it, and that did not get funded. Then two years ago they came and we sort of got some advice from the one-stop folks about what to apply for and how to do it, so we applied again. And we were awarded $130,000 to do a study of the road. And, um, and that was great. Ty and Bond, we hired Ty and Bond and they came and they did a whole bunch of explorations. And it's a typical gravel road. It, goes along a stream, it's got embankment problems, it's got drainage issues, it gets really muddy. Um, but it's, it's uh, so we had this study done and we know that this study can be used to help address how a lot of gravel roads can be addressed. And basically um, the resolutions were running from let's rebuild it and totally redo it as a gravel road to maybe pave it in the future, depending on what the residents want. Um, but 1.2 million for the cheapest option, 4 million for the most expensive option to rebuild this road. Um, so now we're hoping to do a one-stop application and probably will for the next several years because we qualify for strap money to hopefully 
follow up and rebuild this road in such a way that it will be passable. It has houses along it, it connects two towns, um, it is a through road, it's a needed road. Does that help? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to borrow from the mayor's two minutes, but one thing that I did want to add is that I am also a parent of three in the Pioneer Valley school system, and these transportation infrastructure issues are also an education issue. So four days this year, school, the entire district had to close because they couldn't access the, access the bus routes because of closed roads. So I just wanted to also bring that in. Thank you. Um, I don't know. Remind me the agenda of when how when are we stopping for the field trip? Ten forty. Ten forty. Rep Whips. Can I ask a question? Maybe Patricia, you've been around a while. You might be able to answer this or somebody from DOT. Um, when we listen to these smaller towns talk about having to engage Tie and Bond or Western Sampson or whoever they're looking at for just the specs and just the inspection. Years ago, didn't DOT have their own engineers? And is that something that rather than having towns go out to these organizations that um, cost a great deal of money, if there were some in-house engineers that could come out and assess something in Leverett, it could save an awful lot of money for the town and it could be kind of like a rural, a rural engineer to do some of this work. And, create plans and specs for projects like this that wouldn't really, I mean, that's, there's a chunk of the job that the money you could have spent actually doing the work. And I, I feel like maybe decades ago, DOT had their <coughs> engineers, did they not? Yeah, we have a whole staff of engineers, but it depends on, you know, what level granularity you want the study to be. So if, if a town needs us to go out and give a rough estimate, we can do that. Um, we do have a list of office of everyone else, but like, we do try to provide as much technical assistance to the town that we can. Um, but but if you're for looking for a little, like a very detailed study with alternatives analysis, you probably are better off going with consultants. But uh, you can certainly, you know, call Or if we were to that, beef yeah. up the district staff where you had that accessible to towns, it, it, there might be a cost benefit, you know, benefit to the cost of it if we were to give you the capacity to build up your engineering squad. I just, I'm just trying to brainstorm because every town sees this and when we're like, we need 200,000 for a feasibility study and you know, it's hard to get that money and then the cost comes in at a couple million, you're already in the hole. So I, I'm just trying to think if there's a rural alternative that we might be able to lean on DOT for. So, so we have been beefing up staff but not to do not not, not to that level for um, for like developing plans and specs. Uh, something that the districts have been adding on the last couple of years uh, into their um, their chapter 90 group in particular is the it is a coordinator to help like chase things like grant opportunities. That, that's been pretty effective. We've done uh, it, it's only, we're only in year two now with grant opportunities, but it's. Uh, the, We've worked with a couple of big communities. Patty's, Patty's team worked very closely with Springfield, for example, at a major safety issue. We was able to get them some uh, multi-million dollar grants. We also did a similar thing, uh, I think it might have been Brockton, uh, where, where we did some, some work with those guys, again, to try to identify some grant opportunities. So we've been beating up that side, but uh, we haven't approached that yet. We're never gonna say no to extra staff. <laughs> you, you know, so I think I think all of our districts would agree that we, you know having additional resources to do that kind of services is never a bad thing. But uh, we haven't haven't taken a hard look at that yet. I think it's always best to start with the district. Um, yeah. Because we have actually beefed up our traffic safety section, so we actually have been trying to help save and towns troubleshoot certain intersections, providing that technical assistance. Um, we do have another person planning, so we can you know help. Um, towns navigate what is better, you know, a consultant or, you know, applying with MassDOT for a grant. Um, trying to coordinate grants because a lot of towns apply for more than one grant and they're trying to figure out how to put the, all those funding pieces together. So I think it's always great to start with the district and we can offer whatever assistance we're able to offer at that time. Thanks. Yeah. I just want to say one thing about what Marjorie said that I, I want to make sure everyone sinks that point in is that um, 
how they worked on the one-stop application was volunteer residents. Right. It wasn't town staff, it wasn't the DPWs. That is how many of our towns have to get their stuff done. If, if we don't, the COG doesn't have time, really no, in the towns, they don't have the staff. It's our volunteer residents who are doing a lot of the work. So any staff or assistance that uh, is available would be really helpful. Um, I also just want to say, so we have about 15 minutes for general discussion, um, and then we'll do a little recap of what we're going to be doing out on the fair field trip, and then we'll go out and do a little driving. Um, let me just add to what Megan said. The other, the other issue with having volunteers instead of your city engineers that we don't have apply for applications is then the applications can look a little bit less professional. A little, a, you get a, you get fewer points, and so for our rural region, we are really struggling to access discretionary grants because of the limited staff capacity in our region. Did I see a hand up? Oh, yeah. Senator Comerford, thank you. Um, thanks so much uh, for this presentation. Secretary, thank you for being here with your entire team, it seems. Um, and uh, Tina and Michael, thank you. I just wanted to uh, weigh in quickly on two things that we talked about today. One was the microtransit which I have to say was a Herculean lift, and FRTA did it so beautifully. And it was started with social service participants first in the first cohort. Thank you, Megan, for being part of that, um, with Tina and Michael. And what I have heard from providers in Franklin County is a sea change in the ability of their folks to access everything from healthcare to education to childcare and beyond. It is the hope for us in rural uh, Western Massachusetts. We can't run those big buses up to Bernardston and Leiden. We can get a zippy little micro transit bus up, but in order for us to really invest in that entirely, there has to be some ability for Tina and Michael to know that the funding will be sustained. Um, otherwise, it's just super tricky, right? Because they're figuring out how to get these micro transit buses either to their destination, like a public Uber, um, or you know, to intersect with these fixed routes that they're now expanding thanks to additional money. Um, but it is really the hope for us to have any kind of reliable, workable, sustainable um, RTA service, which we love here. Um, and I just want to say just one other m moment on, on Northern Tier. Um, so, you know, in Western Massachusetts, Secretary and everybody, you know that we have four uh, rail projects um, and they're very exciting, right? Um, we did talk about the Berkshire Flyer, which hooks up, right, from New York, which is very exciting. Also, you know, exceeding demands, the West East from Pittsfield, you know, on track, thanks to so much of the governor and MassDOT support. Um, and then, of course, Valley Flyer, as Linda said, exceeding projections. Uh, and that is changing uh, the, the, what we call the knowledge corridor. Uh, and people are beginning to rely on that and plan around it, which is exactly what we wanted when it was pilot service that we were working to get to be permanent. So thank you to MassDOT. The thing I just want to talk about is the Northern Tier. Um, I'm, I'm sure you've heard reports. The Northern Tier calls are full of communities begging for this service. Um, and what Linda said is true, right? The tracks are down. It's not the high speed rail proposed from Pittsfield to, uh, to Boston, which I'm very, very excited about. But we could run these trains very quickly. Um, Again, it's not my expertise, it is your expertise, but from everything I read and from your great team's analysis, really what we need is the social political will um, to make that hookup. And then can you imagine the transformation? Uh, can you imagine, you know, to be in Greenfield, to be able to get to Boston and back? Um, we know, we all know people um, who remember the service, whose caregivers or parents, grandparents went to work in Boston or went to see the Red Sox play, you know, and it was a different community here. Uh, and you know, Secretary, there is a, a, there was a terrible study. Linda and the FERCOG have been looking at, trans, uh, at population numbers decline for many years, but there was a, a recent study that projected the hollowing out of many Franklin County communities, uh, five of them, actually. And it's, it has everything to do with a lack of opportunity here. So. Transit is one of the main opportunity builders for us. Uh, and this, the popular support for Northern Tier knows no ends. Um, the, I, I receive, I'm sure we all receive, emails, calls, letters begging us to do this from everyone, from town administrators to select board members to you know, general public. It is instilling a great deal of hope in Franklin County. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping we can consider it as one 
really significant <coughs> viable option amid the four, um, because we're a vast geographic network out here, right? We've, we've got a lot of the land mass, so we're, we're not going to be served equitably by one east-west route. Um, the people in Orange and Athol, Greenfield, maybe some of them will go and, and when we hook up the Valley Flyer, uh, you know, they'll, they'll be able to do it, but very few compared to what it would mean to have a train stop in Greenfield going east or west. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. Voting. Mm -hmm. Just to add on to something Megan and Lever had said, we have 41, soon to be 42 towns, because Tolland, Tolland, Tolland is trying to join our transit authority. Again, a very um, rural area <laughs> in the midst between us and Berkshire. So that will present a challenge in itself. And usually with these smaller communities, we start off with a volunteer-based program and then try to grow it from there. Um, a lot of our councils on aging, we contract with eight separate councils on aging. And the 41 towns, or soon to be 42 towns that we have, we only have about 10 towns that have some form of fixed route service, which means the rest of the other towns are relying on a very um, small demand response program that typically, you know, we transport people over the age of 60, veterans, people with disabilities, so there's a wide gap there of people from the general public that just do not get transportation. With the access program, we've been able to fill those gaps in. And one of the nice things is, is there's no age restriction. It's just open to the general public as long as we have those empty seats in our buses. We've started a pilot program with Southwick. Humes is actually operating the same software system that we're using with the access program. So they've started that. We're gonna hopefully be having that open to the general public very soon. And we also have Hilltown Easy Ride, which is in the outskirts of Goshen, Plainfield, Cummington. Um, that's going to be coming on board with that as well. So, you know, those are some of the challenges. But again, with the councils on aging that we're dealing with, it's volunteers that are operating those services. It's not paid employees. It's people that are, so there's a lot of turnover with those employees. And it makes it very difficult for us to kind of maintain those contracts and those relationships to grow the program, either because they're older individuals who have been retired and are looking for something to fill in their time and don't necessarily have that IT background and, and the things that needs to happen. So again, the vehicles that we're operating, the smaller vehicles, um, which I'll take the tour of, you've ridden on them, I'm sure. Um, you know, they can accommodate up to 15 people, but in these smaller communities, there are more than that many people that need these opportunities and it makes it difficult because you are, you know, one person picking them up in Goshen to go to a doctor's appointment in Springfield basically is a driver in a vehicle transporting one passenger for two or three hours and it's not very, you know, the return on investment isn't great there, but it's something that's needed, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts or questions? Yes. Uh, so I, I've been in office about 15 months and um, one of the observations that I've been able to make for Franklin County in particular, is they punch above their weight. Linda and her team, Tina, her team, the work that Jesse does at the Chamber. We've heard a lot about the challenges and the opportunities that, that the county faces and some stellar recommendations. I, I hope, Secretary, that you can feel comfortable that investing into these organizations is money well spent. Uh, they, they do a tremendous job with public funds and um, you can be confident that as we start knocking these down, the folks in this room are gonna do right by DOT, by those of us in the legislature and come on this whole. Thanks, Rep Saunders. <laughs> just so you threw it up. <laughs> I just wanna thank the secretary bring your entire, really your entire team here uh, to Franklin County. And I think we find that when people come out to Franklin County and ride a bus or, or walk in our soil, that you have a, a deeper appreciation for, for the challenges and the opportunities uh, that are available here. So I just want to extend my thanks to you and certainly welcome you to, to say a few words yes. <laughs> since we've been yes. talking yes. at you yes. for yes. Exactly. Yes. 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 Exactly. Yes. 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 Say the same thing. Yes, absolutely. I mean, many of you know, I have spent more years living in rural communities than I have anywhere else. And I think, you know, talking about communities with dirt roads, that was growing up. I learned to drive on a dirt road. And I feel like driving on dirt roads and driving in Midwestern winters, I think made me the driver that I am. <laughs> 
So I understand the challenges. You know, my family still lives in a rural community where you know a lot of the family farms have closed. A lot of the industrial areas that people can work in have closed. So people have a lot of limited options, and if they don't have transportation to be able to get to jobs, then you start seeing people leaving. And they don't want to leave. Very rarely have I met someone who grew up or lives in a rural community that wants to leave. But many times, and the reason I left, is education. I need to go to college. And getting to a college from where I live was virtually impossible. So that it forced me to move eight hours from the farm I grew up on just to go to school. And I also spent a lot of time talking about the limited job opportunities for people when you live in these communities, staying with my family, it just, it continues to make every part of their life so much more difficult than it needs to be. And transportation is that lifeline. And for me, we have been talking about Chapter 90 reform for a very, very long time. Very long time. We know something needs to change on this, and I think the same way that we talk about rural transportation and the RTAs, we have to start thinking differently because so much of it really is a bias towards the cities and a bias towards the eastern communities. I think that's the other reason I'm so excited about Andy being here and noting that his title is West East Rail. <laughs> it is West East Rail. It is not East West Rail. Thank you. East West is that is not a thing. It is West East, and I think it really is. It's a combination of putting new services, but also reigniting these rails, these stations that have been closed. I mean, a lot of them since the 70s and the 80s. So I think there is a lot of opportunity, but it has to be a shift in the way that we're approaching this. And I think for me, it is an equity issue. We talk a lot about environmental justice communities. We talk a lot about environmental justice neighborhoods, but so many times that is talking about a city usually Boston, Cambridge, or Somerville. This is an equity issue for the residents who are out here. You shouldn't have to move just to be able to access the services that you need. I'm very excited about the tour today. I've spent a lot of time out in Franklin County, and as I was saying, my commute here is so much better than it is to my actual office in Boston. But I'm excited about this tour, but beyond that, and beyond just kind of the conversations we've had here, we have to do something, we know that, as the Commonwealth, this administration has been very focused on rural communities, but it isn't just talk. We do really genuinely want to figure out what are the steps, and it is going to take time, but there are near-term things that we can do. And so I don't want to delay the tour anymore, but I just want you to know that this is going to be the type of thing where we're coming back. We are talking about actually, okay, what sort of funding can we do? What are some changes that we can do? It, like I said, it will be slow, but much faster than it has been. Because I do, I feel like Franklin County does punch above its weight. And so now for us, it is our responsibility, especially on the administrative side. The districts just do miracles. Y'all do such an amazing job. They do, yes. It really, it really. Right. And so, um, now, so uh, you know, on behalf of the delegation, um, we just really want to thank Secretary, um, you, Secretary, and your team. Um, for coming. We really want to recognize the FRTA as steadfast partners, um, of course the Mass, the Mass Dot districts, and of course FERCOG. Um, they are unbelievable for us out here. Um, we couldn't do it without them. And there is a closeness, as I think you can tell, between the delegation and all of these entities. And it, it just comes from both having excellent people uh, in the jobs, um, thanks to you all, but, uh, but also just believing as we do that the only way we're gonna thrive, and we're against all odds, as you know, uh, is when we do it together. And so we are really dedicated to making the most of this moment, and your coming here has been just a huge boost of hope and inspiration, you know, that we can find a way forward, as you said, toward greater equity across the board. So I'm very, very grateful. Yeah. I'm going to turn it over to my sister. Absolutely, yeah, thank you. Um, and to our teams who really worked hard to yes. bring together today to make today happen, thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you. Um, and, you know, I think as much as we are partners here in the region, we hope that you heard today that we want to be partners to you as well in whatever you're undertaking because as we see here every single day, it's only by working together that we're able to move the needle. And so we really appreciate you coming out here and, and hope that you see us as the partners that we see you as um, moving forward. So thank you, and there's food. And 
Drive safely. <laughs> <laughs> and Secretary, Secretary, you don't know if you wanted to say any closing. Sorry. I, I just want to echo all of that. We see you as amazing partners, 100%. And I have to say, you know, from FERCOD, from the FRTA, from the conversations we've had with you, we think that there is a lot we can do in the near term. And we were already just talking about it on the bus. So we definitely feel that partnership. And we just want to make it stronger. Thank you. Great. I really appreciate you being here. And seriously, anybody wants to go on a Maple Tour? That's where we're heading to next. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I already, I already promised. I promised I was going to come for Maple Syrup. Beautiful. Come back anytime. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.